What's cracking, homies and homets? Welcome back to the HQ. It's your boy Nicholas here. Big dogs gotta eat fantasy football. Whether you're joining us from YouTube or whether you're joining us on the podcast. Podcast is also now available on iTunes, Spotify, Google Home, Play, whatever they call it. All those Stitcher, all those kind of things, um, as requested by the people for the people. So all those links will be down below if you need them. Today we are going to get into some busts, some players to avoid. I've touched a lot on sleepers, I've touched a lot on values. Where I want to draft guys. Today we're talking about where I do not want to draft guys. So we're looking at five dudes and some honorary mention guys at the end of the video. So stay tuned for that. That uh, that I just you know. Like I say in my Instagram post, I don't I don't think they're gonna fall apart like Post Malone, but I just don't think their ADP is warranted. Their ADP is warranted where they're getting picked right now in fantasy football, so I'm here to tell you to stay away from them, at least if their ADP stays here. So before we get into the video, um actually I have nothing to say to you guys, so let's just get into the video. Also, one thing I'm trying to do is get more of a schedule for how I'm going to be posting uh, this summer so you guys know when to expect videos and stuff. I want to do Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then something Sunday. So what I'm thinking is this. Mock drafts on Monday, Wednesday is going to be something random. Like Wednesday and Friday are going to be like the real valuable video. I mean, not that mock drafts aren't, but like these kind of videos, like top five or like top whatever. Those kind of videos, Wednesday, Friday. Sunday, I want to do something more engaging. Like, you know how I do live streams during the actual season? I'm thinking about doing a, a, a live stream every Sunday. I was going to do answering social questions like my most frequently like my 10 most frequently asked or, or take 10 random social questions and just make a video of that every Sunday but that's actually going to be included in my draft guide which is available for pre-order right now on my website get it now for the discounted price on July 1st the price goes up I'm going to be taking uh, the most frequently asked social media questions each week and then putting it into my draft guide so that I can interact with you guys more so I think Sunday I'm going to do live streams now when I do live streams throughout the year if they're not like during football Sundays I don't get a lot of people coming into them so let me know if you'd be down if you guys want me to do live streams on Sunday because that's how I'll do that's how I can do my content right let me know what kind of videos you want you guys want to see on Wednesday and Friday so I'll do mock drafts and two randos Wednesday Friday and then some kind of engagement video probably live streams on Sunday just to answer any general questions that you guys have I'm also going to be I'm, I'm, I'm making a private community soon the first 50 people that pre-ordered my draft guide which is already we're already above 50 but the first 50 people are going to get put into this private community for free for three months I mean this is going to be like a monthly kind of fee thing it's going to be a community where you can get more engaged with like other people that are you know in fantasy football obviously that care more about it and then we'll be like talking way more personally within that community I'm going to do I think Tuesday night live streams throughout the summer and throughout the year if you are in the, the private community so I'll, I'll keep you guys posted more details on that but I want to hear your feedback on on my schedule for this year also on that last clip if you saw my face you look real oily I'm not an I'm not a fish I was outside it's really nice out. It's like 85 I might have put some sunscreen on and laid out shirtless on my front lawn so I had sunscreen on my face that was sweat and whatnot so I've since gone to the bathroom washed myself off and looked presentable for you guys that are watching me via YouTube so I just had to let you guys know that because I know you guys be plotting someone's gonna call out and be like yo whose man's is this get this let him wash his his face now I'm just rambling, but I want to get into the busts, right? So top five players to avoid. We're going to start off with a quarterback. I think this is probably going to be a popular pick for people to stay away from in the fantasy realm this year. So Jared Goff, Jared Goff, going currently right now, pick number 87, quarterback 10 off the board. He's getting picked as a top 10 quarterback. Last year, he rode about 3,800 passing yards, 28 passing touchdowns, seven interceptions, uh, to a strong QB12 finish, especially compared to what he did his rookie year. Everyone wrote him off real quick. You might say, wow, what a year. What a year for this sophomore quarterback down in L.A., out in L.A., wherever you are coming from. I guess down in L.A. would only make sense if you're literally up in San Francisco. So, apologize for my weak geographical skills. Anyways, this is the third year, right? You say, ooh, nice step forward in the second year. Now he's ready to explode in the second year. And I say... Fake news to that shit. Fake news. Jared Goff, where do we start? Well, the offense flourished last year under Sean McVay, right? Led by Goff. But in my opinion, Goff was... You're going to hear me say Goff, all right? So get over him from New Jersey. Goff was a game manager, if I've ever seen one. That is what he does. He is a game manager disguised by this high-powered offense, beautifully led by the genius Sean McVay and the talented weapons around him. So... He takes what he can get, right? He isn't asked to do much, and he gets the job done when he's supposed to. And that's important. That's important as a game manager, of course. When you're asked to do something, you get it done. 
Um, he doesn't go above and beyond. So what exactly do I mean by that? We're going to break it down here, as we always do with big dogs. Got to eat fantasy mother effing football. <sighs> I mean a few things, right? One, he does not throw the ball downfield, or he didn't throw the ball downfield often last year. Didn't do it his freshman year, or his rookie year, I guess you could say. You know what pisses me off? I don't know, this is such a random thought. How everyone, you know, when you're in high school, everyone calls your teacher a teacher. As soon as you go to college, you call them a professor. Like, you know what I like doing? I think I like things that are so anti-swag that you could use them and they become swag, right? Like, I'm calling, if I'm not in college anymore, I'm old as shit. But had I been in college now, I'd be calling everyone my teacher. I'm done with the professor talk, man. Professor's like, professor's actually a kind of epic word. So I'm not going to throw hate on the professor, but I feel like that should be hell for, like, I should be a professor. I, you should call me Professor Big Dog. I feel like that's warranted, right? You know what I'm saying? Anyway, okay. Um, and like Big Baller brand, right? With with Lonzo Ball or LeVar Ball, crazy ass LeVar Ball. It got so ridiculous to the point that I actually think it's kind of swaggy and I want to cop some of their gear. What the hell was I even talking about? Okay, so it's not their style of offense. Oh, I was because I, I called him a, a, a freshman instead of a rookie. Okay, sorry, I'm not on my game right now. I'm getting distracted heavily. I need to start taking Adderall again. Okay, so Goff's average depth of throw per Pro Football Focus was 8.5 last year. His average depth of target, 24th amongst quarterbacks in the NFL. Per player profiler, he was 20th in deep ball attempts, 18th in air yards, 19th in pass attempts distance, 21st in air yards per attempt, and 26th in pressure completion percentage. That last one has nothing to do with throwing the ball deep, I'm just saying. Um, so he was like 20th or worse in pretty much every deep ball category in terms of efficiency or just volume uh, and just throwing the ball down there last year. He just doesn't throw the ball deep much, right? They don't ask him to do much, which is fine for an NFL quarterback. But for a fantasy quarterback who you're going to be picking in the top 10, thing, you know, it's a little different here. Big thing to take away is, yes, like the 28 to 7 touchdown to interception ratio is fantastic. But when you don't throw a lot of shots down the field, uh, it's easy to kind of shy away from throwing a high number of, of interceptions, right? You're taking a lot more efficient, accurate throws, and those are your pass attempts. So much less likely that you that you have a high interception total. Um, so 28 touchdowns, of course, that is a lot. Are they fluky too? Yeah, a little bit. I'm here to say, yeah, they're a little bit. There was no quarterback. For those of you guys who watched the Rams play, um, there really wasn't any quarterback in the NFL that had more passes or easy throws to their weapons where their weapons after the fact after the catch really put on display uh really shoved up Goff's statistics right dump it off the girly give it to Watkins give it to Cooper Cup and let them do something after the catch there wasn't a quarterback who who benefited more so from their weapons than Goff did last year Gurley was literally the number one running back in the NFL last year in yards after the catch and that was among all running backs that had at least 21 receptions. So basically, if you if you caught one ball a game, that was in that. And Gurley had the number one 12.6 uh, yards after catch. That's what Gurley was at. So that's pretty much unsustainable. Cooper Cup was fifth highest in yards after catch for all slot wide receivers in the NFL. Um, and I went back and I watched Watkins' touchdowns. For almost, for the most part, they were like one or two yard slant plays, which is fine. It's whatever. Uh, a lot of them were touchdowns that Watkins made on his own, right? Either behind the line of scrimmage, a yard or two in front of the line of scrimmage, and then he'd break off for 15, 20-yard touchdowns. There was one really, really, really beautiful ball that Goff delivered to Watkins. So before you guys say that, I know. I'm not saying Goff is not capable of throwing accurate deep balls, but in this offense, they don't ask him to. He doesn't need to. He doesn't attempt those, right? And that's automatically lowering your ceiling. I think he has a great floor, but it's automatically lowering your ceiling as a fantasy quarterback. Also, his touchdown percentage, right? The percentage of his passes that went for touchdowns was 6%. One, that's super, super high. The only three guys that that was lower than last year in the NFL was Carson Wentz, Aaron Rodgers, Russell Wilson. True, true deep throwers, accurate deep throwers down the field. It's unsustainable for, for Goff to be up in that range for more than a season at a time. 
Now, when he gets the job done, what do I mean? He, he's asked to do so against certain teams and not against other teams, and this chart speaks volumes, I think, to that. These are his splits. When you look at in-split, you're looking at games in which he played against top 18 pass defenses. Out of split, you're looking at games where he played outside of the top 18 pass defense in terms of ranking, like how good the pass defense was. There is literally over a 10 point fantasy difference when he plays against good defenses versus when he plays against bad ones. And top 18 isn't necessarily even crazy, right? It's just average. You look at that, right? He struggles against great fantasy defenses or good fantasy defenses, and he, sh and he does work against the really bad one. And the problem with that is, per Fantasy Pros, Goff will have the sixth hardest schedule for fantasy quarterbacks, not to mention Philadelphia and at Arizona are his fantasy playoff matchups. Um, it's similar to, you know, Big Ben on the ho uh, home, on the road. Uh, that's kind of Goff versus very good opponents and not so good opponents. So last year, you know, he had six games of 225 passing yards or fewer. Six of, I think he played in, did he play in 15 or 16? I'm not actually sure. I think he played in 15 because they didn't play the last week. So six of 15, which is 40% of his games, he threw for 225 passing yards or fewer, which is not good in today's NFL. That to me says game manager. That doesn't say statistic guy, football statistic guy, right? So I think, I, like again, I think Goff is a guy who's a really nice floor. I'd be absolutely fine with him in two quarterback leagues, but to get him at QB 10, I would much rather prefer Matt Stafford, Big Ben, uh, Matt Ryan, who are going at that range or lower. It's not like, you know, Goff exploded. He was quarterback 12 last year, threw for 3,800 yards, um, obviously without the 16th game, would have been about 4,000, but that's like, you're banking on him taking a huge step forward when there's clearly going to rely on their defense, which is very revamped. Uh, they're going to rely on Todd Gurley a lot, so they're not going to ask a ton of Jared Goff in season three. That's why I just, I think quarterback tends too high. So we'll move on to number two, a running back. Let me make sure this bad boy's still on. We recording. Yeah, we Gucci, baby. We so, we so Gucci. We so Gucci. It's almost Memorial Day weekend. The mood is good. Just got a haircut looking. Okay, I'm not looking the best, but what was I even saying? Oh, number two, number two, Derrick Henry. Derrick Henry. I've talked about him on my Instagram a lot. I'm not really sure if I've talked about him through YouTube, but he's currently going off the board uh, late 20s, so like 28 to 30, running back 16. And this will be one of the more fun debates this offseason, I think, between just like whether or not you want to draft Henry that high and then Henry versus Lewis, right? Lewis versus Henry, however you want to do it. Wasn't that the... No, it was Lewis and Clark, the exploration. This is what that is. Lewis or Henry exploration. That's what the 2018 offseason is going to be ded dedicated to. You're going to look back and be like, what was the 2018 offseason? It's going to be the Lewis and Henry exploration. I don't know where this is going, as per almost everything I say. So the the Titans, the, they took a big turn this offseason, right? They finally let go of what was holding them back and what was holding the team back, the offense, and Marcus Mariota as a quarterback, right? They let go of their coaching staff. They let go of DeMarco Murray. They signed former Rams offensive coordinator Matt LaFleur and former Patriots stud running back Dion Lugod. Lewis. Lewis. Lewis, as most of you may or may not know him as. So considering the money, we're looking at the money that Deion Lewis received. Four years, $20 million, big running back contract, $11.5 million guaranteed. GTD, good to zominate. GTZ is what it should be called, guaranteed. And I think you're just an idiot if you, don't, if you think that Lewis is just merely going to be a compliment to Derrick Henry. That is 100% not the case. Problem is, Henry's getting picked about 25 spots at pick 28 earlier than Deion Lewis, who was going off the board at running back 22, 51st, 52nd overall. Going back to his 2017 performance, this should not be the case. And I'm not here to say that Deion Lewis is gonna is gonna beat out Henry for the starting job and take uh, 65, 70 percent of the of the target splitter and, and carry split or anything like that. But I think it's gonna be a lot closer than people realize. Lewis was fantasies. Running back 17 last year. Henry was running back 30, and this is half point PPR overall. Henry was actually running back 37 in fantasy points per game among all uh, among all running backs that played in 10 or more games. Running back 37 on points per game. Lewis ranked second in the NFL in yards per carry, second in the NFL in tackles evaded per attempt per Pro Football Focus, first overall in yards created per attempt per player profile. Tied for fourth in yards after carry. For a smaller back, he did pretty damn well. And all these statistics, like the PFF statistics, can be found in Pro Football Focus's uh, Edge subscription. It's like $24 or $29 for the season. I'll have the links below. 
Um, I am an affiliate of them, so I'll get a tiny bit of a kickback if you purchase it through the link. I don't, I don't know. I just figured I'd throw that in there. I'm going to be spending a lot of money on margaritas this weekend, so hopefully someone could pay for them. Let's see. So, yeah, Lewis is a guy who's usually labeled as too small, too frail, not going to be able to handle the load. Over the last half of the 2017 NFL season, their last eight games, the Patriots, only nine running backs had more total touches than Deion Lewis, and he held up pretty damn fine. So you have to ask, where does you know where does this leave Derrick Henry, the former second round pick out of Alabama, heading into his third season? Well, to be honest, what I think is they're going to have almost a near even touch split. I think it's going to be very very close when all is said and done. Lewis should basically slip right into Demarco's role that he had last year, maybe a tiny bit more or less volume in terms of carries, but he should be exponentially more efficient with the touches that he gets than Demarco was last year. Demarco was something awful. I feel horrible for the Titans fans that had to watch that offense go last year. Um, yeah, Murray was bad. Lewis is really good. So I want to take a look at this chart. And this was last year's kind of splits between Murray and Henry. The overall carry count was very, very close. Things I want to point out here, I'll, I'll give you guys like a, a few seconds to kind of just look over this. I'm talking about just the overall volume and then the percentage of the team's, you know, carries or targets or whatever that, that each player got. Take a second to look over it to kind of get acquainted with what we had there. A few things to point out. Like I said, the carry split is really close. And admittedly, I do expect that to swing in Henry's favor in 2018 over Deion Lewis as the primary ball caller. Car Carrier. He should be the early down bruiser, right? But that's kind of all I see Henry as. He owns the first two downs, maybe, right? Deion Lewis is plenty capable between the tackles runner on early downs. And I think they said that loud and clear when they signed him to a $20 million contract. Um, and the passing game split is where things stand out. Murray accounted for 75% of their running back targets and 79% of their running back receptions. Henry, as a player, has been totally uninvolved in the passing game in his two years in Tennessee, and he was at Alabama too. So there's no, like you could say, and this is always like a bad analysis from people in the offseason. Oh well, he's plenty capable of catching balls, and I'm I'm guilty of it too. I say that with prospects that I like a lot. Oh, well, he's an athlete; he can catch balls. That does not mean the teams are going to use him that way. And and I think it's speaking to this, right? They did not use him that way in Alabama. They did not use him that way in Tennessee. At Tennessee, he had a total of 17 receptions over three years to go along with 602 carries. So of his 619 total touches at Alabama, only 2.7% of his touches came from catching the ball. I don't think I, made, I need to make a point here that Lewis should fill that slot exactly what Murray left on the table like indefinitely, right? What's more exciting is the fact that last year the Titans backfield caught an NFL low 50 passes. This was my Wild Stat Wednesday from this week on my Instagram. If you're not following me, make sure you're doing that. Their entire backfield caught 50 passes. There was 14 running backs alone in the NFL last year that topped that number. There was 14 RBs in the NFL. NFL I'm like from the, the dirty south. NFL last year that had more catches than the entire Tennessee bike field. So with Matt LaFleur coming in, right, he's coming. He, he, his heritage is of the Rams. He, he played under or he coached as the OC under... Sean McVay, he was in Atlanta under Kyle Shanahan, right, working with uh, Matt Ryan as the OC, as the uh, quarterbacks coach and whatnot. So he's got some, he's got some pretty good experience with pass catching running backs. And that number of 50 catches has nowhere to go except shooting up, and that's where I love Deion Lewis this year. So I expect that number to increase. Most interesting part I think to me was goal line and red zone carries, right? So people are excited that Henry should take over as the primary early down back and as the goal line back and get the, you know, get the majority of goal line, 10 zone, red zone carries. But he pretty much had that last year. He led DeMarco Murray in 10 zone carries. He tied him in goal line carries and he actually beat him in red zone carries by seven. So we had the higher percentage of the team's carries. Now that might inflate a little bit, uh, but Henry was not good when he got the goal line carries, right? He scored one of six touchdowns from within the five yard line. That's what I consider a goal line carry. One of six. DeMarco Murray, on the other hand, converted four of six. I'll be honest, I definitely see an increase of, of Derrick Henry going from six goal line touches probably up to maybe, I don't know, um, doubling that. If you put him at 12 goal line carries, which would put him top eight in terms of volume goal line carries among all NFL running backs, you know, you have to look at what if he's not successful down there, right? He went one of six last year. What if we, what if we give him three of six of the additional six attempts down there, right? And he goes four for 12 on the year, which isn't really bad when you look at the rest of the running backs that, that have that type of volume down there. What's that make him? Uh, an eight touchdown scorer instead of five that he had last year? So he's not, he's no longer like 
um, running back 37 on a points per game basis. Maybe he's running back 23 or 24, right? That I'm okay with that, and I'm perfectly fine. I'm not saying I'm completely not drafting Derrick Henry, but you guys have to understand that realistically, he's going to own two downs. Do it. Deion Lewis is going to get 80% of the passing work, and we're not sure if Derrick Henry is going to get all of the goal line work because Deion Lewis was good down there last year towards the end of the season for the Patriots. We're not sure if he's going to be good even if he does get all the goal line work. Um, so picking him as a top 28 where he's going right now, top 28 pick overall, I think is, is, is crazy. My thing is here, I have a few more paragraphs I want to get off to you guys, so I'll just read it. My worry with Henry comes down to this. He's an early down bruiser. He will get double digit carries week in and week out, and he should see a lot of goal line work. But remember also Mariota is a runner, right? So he'll certainly naturally just take some of those looks down by the goal line. If they're on the four or five yard line, Mariota might run it himself, right? He's totally capable of that. So that lowers his ceiling there uh, just just naturally. Henry is not involved in the passing game. So on days where he does not score a touchdown, you're looking at between 12 and maybe 17 carries, 50 to 8, 80 total yards uh, that are not that are scoreless, with maybe a catch or two. If you look at his season last year, and I'm including their two playoff games, so, so 18 games in total Henry played. He was completely boom or bust. I don't think enough people are talking about this or looking at this. Of 18 games, he was at six yards per carry or better in five of those 18 games, but 3.5 yards per carry or worse in nine of 18 games. He rushed for over 90 yards in four of 18 games, but less than 35 yards in 10 of 18 games. In 10 of 18 games, he had less than 35 rushing yards and he had double digit carries in 10 of 18 games. So he certainly had the opportunity to rush for more than that. He just was not efficient with it. I think he broke out some big plays that kind of boosted his stats, and he's just not a, a very efficient player overall. You know, I, I think people are projecting the carry split between Henry and Lewis to be more dramatic than it really will be. Like I said, I think the touch split overall is going to maybe favor Henry, but in, in any kind of PPR leagues, half PPR, even .25 PPR, Lewis, I think, is the play. I mean, like in a vacuum, right? In a vacuum, I, I might take Henry, but because they're going 25 picks apart, I just think Henry's a very bad value here. Uh, and then we move on to number three, another running back, and this is kind of blatantly obvious. This is Carlos Hyde, running back out of Cleveland. Currently going pick still, I pick 53, running back 26. Um, you know, obviously if you're into fantasy football right now, if you remotely follow the NFL offseason, like, you know not to take him at this spot. But again, a lot of my views come in later in the offseason and people might not be up, you know, people might, might not have been paying attention to what happened. They don't know that uh, Carlos Hyde moved to the Browns and they're like, oh, I'm excited. He's got opportunity now. They don't know maybe Crowell left. They don't know that they signed Nick Chubb or who, and some people might not even know who Nick Chubb is. So I'm doing it for the more general group here. The Browns signed Carlos Hyde to this three-year, $15 million contract before the NFL draft, right? They weren't really sure how that was going to go. Then they go ahead and use... Um, a second round pick, you know what was actually interesting? The rumor that came out the other day was that the Cleveland Browns were actually offering the 35th overall pick where they drafted Nick Chubb to the Eagles for Nick Foles. And the Eagles actually denied it. But I'm wondering what their running back situation would have been had they traded that 35th pick, you know, took the, the offensive lineman at 32, I think it was, and then not had that. Uh, pick, you know, would they have drafted uh, a different running back later? Who knows? I don't know if that speaks to any of you guys. Maybe it does. Anyways, they picked Nick Chubb 35th overall. He's an absolute beast. Really good running back out of Georgia. Had Saquon Barkley not been such like a household name and such a generational prospect at the running back position, Nick Chubb would, would have been probably a household name around, around the combine time and around the draft time because he absolutely dominated the combine and is a very good running back, basically. How do I see it playing out? Uh, I think they're going to split the work. I think Hyde is going to get involved. I think Chubb is going to get involved. Duke Johnson's obviously their passing down back. Both of them will pretty much lose all the passing work to, to Duke Johnson. Um, I think that eventually Chubb, Chubb's talent and his just ability as a player is going to surpass Carlos Hyde. I think he's a much better run. Not much better. I like Carlos Hyde as a player, but I think he's a better running back than Carlos Hyde. And I'd say it's just a really bad situation for redraft leagues. So I would stay away from the backfield pretty much altogether, unless you're looking at Duke and PPR leagues, but they're going to give up all the passing work, right? Um, Duke had two consecutive seasons now where he's among the league leaders in receptions for running backs. And, you know, you might look at it like, oh, you know, Isaiah Crowell had 40 receptions or whatever a couple of years ago with Duke Johnson there leading the way in the backfield. But you got also have to look at Hyde and Chubb are going to be splitting that work as well. And Chubb was not someone utilized in the passing game at Georgia. Um, Hyde showed off to be pretty good 
in San Francisco, right? Catching like 58 balls, I think. Did he have 58 targets or did he catch? 50? I think he caught 58 passes. So he was super he uh, heavily utilized, but that was a product of Kyle Shanahan's offense. He's not going to be getting those looks now with Duke Johnson there. Um, and that's what made him such a valuable fantasy play last year. So if you had Hyde and you're like, oh, low-key, he was really good, it was because Kyle Shanahan's offense really propped him up to be the pass catcher, and he's not getting that work in, in Cleveland. And that's also what makes Jarek McKinnon so valuable this year, in my opinion. So, again, this is more an, a, a more obvious pick, but I just wanted to, for the people that are going to watch this later, July, August, and drafting around that time, do not jump for Hyde just because maybe you owned him last year. And these next two guys I have talked about in my top 10 tight end rankings video. So if you want to check that out, I will link it here so you could do that. I went in more in depth, so I'm not going to go crazy here. If you guys probably know like who I'm thinking about right now. And on, a, on another note, I thought it was actually kind of funny that that Hunter Henry video I put out the other night. I was just like literally in bed about to go to sleep. And then I saw the Hunter Henry news. And then like so many of you guys like reached, like tweeted or, or Instagram DM'd or whatever, commented on YouTube but saying like Hunter Henry passed away basically he didn't actually pass away and guys I, I was kidding about uh, clearly i was kidding about hibernating from bdge because hunter henry went down i mean this is something that happens every offseason guys that we really like get hurt early in the summer then we forget about them. we forget about them right we move on and we get to the next best thing and for hunter henry the next best thing is absolutely not jimmy graham so don't get that shit in your head so yeah hunter henry's out which sucks because he was probably the single best value at the tight end position this year um, and he made everyone else's value even worse, right? If you're going to take Ertz or Kelsey, or if you're going to take Jimmy Graham, at the, or like in those areas where they're going, Hunter Henry just made the, all their values worse. So this kind of it kind of sucks, and this actually makes these guys that I'm talking about now a little bit more valuable in the sense that now you can't get a guy like Henry where he was going. Anyways, the first of which is Zach Ertz, currently going off the board, 35th overall, tight end number three, and I've talked like I, I went in on him in the tight ends video, but. This has nothing to do with Ertz as a player. I think he's a fine player. I think he's a very, very good tight end. He's been one of the most consistent and one of the best in the league over the over the past three seasons. I went back and looked at some numbers. Basically, from 2015 to 2017, in those three years, he ranks third overall in targets with 328, third in receptions with 227, and fourth in receiving yards, 2,493 total between the three seasons. However, the touchdown totals is, is what gets me, right? His target, reception, and yardage totals basically year over year have not changed whatsoever, literally from year over year. So people are getting high on him because last year was the first time he actually, you know, produced like a real fantasy producer in terms of touchdowns where he scored eight. Two years ago, it was two. Last year, it was four. And this previous season, 2017, was eight. But his targets, receptions, and receiving yards have been the exact same in those, in those three years, which is why you can't get too hyped up and expect that the touchdowns stay the same because it's not like he got more involved in the offense, right? He just happened to score more. So you can't can't rely on those touchdown fluctuations. But when you look at the larger picture, here is the tight end status as a whole. The fact that while Kelsey and Ertz are, actually this is ridiculous because Gronk is somehow, this is on MFL 10, so these are cash leagues and this is real, but this is for the month of May only, which is insane that Kelsey's going ahead of Gronk. There's no way that you'll ever see Kelsey going ahead of Gronk in an actual league, at least, you know, I don't think I'll see that in any of my leagues. But um, the draft app, which I promote all the time, if you want to use uh, Best Ball, which you can start drafting now in cash leagues for as little as a dollar, head over there, use BDGE as the promo code, draft.com. Sign up with BDGE as the promo code, you'll get a free $3 entry. Um, so there's that. But draft app has them at Ertz 31, Kelsey 24, Gronk at 20, which is more realistic, definitely. My thing is touchdowns per game, right? We know Gronk. Kelsey and Ertz are all going to get the targets. They're all going to get the catches. They're all going to get the yards. But Gronk is a career .75 touchdown a game guy. 75% of his games, he scores a touchdown. Kelsey has been at .36. Ertz has been even lower at .33 over the last three seasons. They score one out of every three games historically. Gronk is a three out of every four games scorer. Gronk doubles, more than doubles your chances of scoring pretty much. So it's more of a position relevant argument here. And you've heard me make this argument multiple times. So that's why I think Gronk, the fact that these two are getting picked so close to Gronk is what makes him so valuable. And that's what would have made Hunter Henry so valuable because he easily, um, he was at, let me see, Hunter was going at pick 71, tight end seven. He has a 0.48 touchdowns per game number over the last two years, which is way better than what Ertz and Kelsey had. Um, but, you know, while having a good tight end is nice, like Ertz, it'd be nice to have him in the lineup. Those 800 yards and five touchdowns you're going to get from Ertz, which are like what he's been giving the last few years, look at the guys going around him per ADP. 
Wouldn't you rather have a 15 touchdown upside in Devonta Adams, a hundred catch upside in Adam Thielen, a 1500 total yard upside in Joe Mixon, 40 passing touchdown, probably like, that's probably his average, right? For Aaron Rodgers, then what you'd get at Ertz. I understand it's relevant to your position and what you're getting behind him, but I would, th those points overall are gonna make up way more for you taking Zach Ertz over a guy like Delaney Walker, which, to, to speak on that, answer me this. Leave a comment down below. Why would you want Zach Ertz over Delaney Walker after you listen to this? Delaney Walker has also put up 800 plus receiving yards in each of the past three seasons, exactly what Ertz has done. And Delaney Walker's actually done it in four straight seasons. And Walker's 0.35 touchdowns per game in that span is higher than Ertz. So I think Delaney's getting severely underrated, actually. And I didn't point that out enough in my tight end ranking videos. But now that Hunter Henry's out, I think Delaney Walker might be my most valuable tight end that you can get later in drafts. Putting up the exact same numbers that Ertz has done over the last few years, uh, and when you can't rely on touchdowns because they're both about the same in terms of touchdowns per game, why not go with the cheaper pick by like 40 or 50 picks? Doesn't make sense. And lastly, number five, another tight end, Jimmy Graham. I'm not, I can't talk about this enough. He's going at pick 62, tight end six. In any sort of league that's not completely standard in terms of scoring, this is an awful pick. Sure, you could put him with Rodgers, but all he could do is catch touchdowns now with a QB that doesn't throw to the tight end in the end zone. And I back this up with plenty of numbers in the uh, tight end ranking video. So I highly suggest, I know I keep mentioning that, but I highly suggest you look at that if, if you didn't and want to get a better feel for why I don't like Ertz, why I don't like Jimmy Graham. He finished first overall in tight end touchdowns last year with 10 while leading the entire NFL in red zone and 10 zone targets. Even with that, he finished as tight end five in fantasy. That's extremely hard to do at a position, right? To lead your position in touchdowns at a position that relies so heavily on its fantasy production from touchdowns, you still finish as number five when you led them in touchdowns. Doesn't make sense. Um, so you would assume, you know, you score those kind of touchdowns, you're gonna dominate in terms of ranking. Not the case. He finished 10th in, uh, in receptions, you know, ninth in receptions among tight ends, 17th in receiving yards. But he, he just offers a little outside of scoring. And do you think he's gonna lead the NFL? Like he did that last year, that, that 10 touchdowns. Do you think he's really gonna lead the NFL again in 10 zone targets and in red zone targets? I do not think so, man. Aaron Rodgers does not force the ball. Aaron Rodgers picks his spots, whoever's open. Devonta Adams is gonna get a ton of those looks. I wouldn't be surprised if someone else emerges as a, as a good wide receiver three there. So Jimmy Graham's not going to lead the NFL in those targets again. He's not going to see those 10 touchdowns. So, um, you know, say he does have another monster scoring year, right? I still I still think you're drafting him. At, if you're drafting him as tight end six, you're drafting him at a ceiling because he was tight end five last year while leading the, the NFL in, in tight end touchdowns and, and targets in the red zone and 10 zone. Um, so if he flames out like pretty much every single Green Bay tight end that, that gets hyped up and, and then eventually flames out, then you basically wasted a fifth round pick here. So I'm staying away from his Graham as much as I want. So that's that. Um, that concludes it. But, you know, I didn't go into any wide receivers. And I'll be honest, I'm having a hard time finding wide receivers that I absolutely hate at their ADPs right now. So some guys that I don't exactly love. And this is all, guys, all this information is listed in my blog post. So if you head over to Big Dog Fantasy, BigDogsFantasy.com. Um, you can just click on the blog section up top. You can sign up for the newsletter. So if you want to hear more busts, I email out uh, one sleeper, one bust, and one tip or trick fantasy football related every single week to people who are on my email list. All you got to go, all you got to do is go to www.georgebush.com. No, www. Uh, I can't say the word W without thinking of George W www.bigdogsfantasy.com. It'll be linked down below. And on the homepage, just scroll down. You'll see a, a place to put your email and your name and your info for that. And then you'll start getting three emails a week, bust, sleeper, tip, or trick. Um, so if you're into this kind of thing, that'd be cool. So I do not love Tyree Kill at pick 26 right now, right? They add Sammy Watkins to the mix on a monster contract, right? So they obviously plan on using him. Huge contract. I'm not one who goes like, oh, they gave him money, so they have to use him. But the size of the contract he got is really, really, really big. And maybe that says more, speaks more to the fact that they, they want to make sure that they, they do this right for Patrick Mahomes and his development. But I, just, I still think Watkins is going to be heavily involved just because of that money. They have the new face at quarterback. We don't know, right? But you could say he has tons of upside and he could be a great quarterback, but it's still a question mark there. Um, they have a new offensive coordinator there uh who was a running backs coach eric Bellini. i don't know someone's gonna correct me anyway so that's uh just a lot of changes there in kc which is why i don't love three kill at pick 26 
And then you have T.Y. Hilton, who's going 32 in best ball leagues, which is ridiculous because you're basically assuming Andrew Luck is back and healthy. Um, so this is more just a best ball pick because obviously we'll have a much clearer picture of T.Y. Hilton's outlook once we know what's really going on with Andrew Luck. He still literally has not thrown a football yet, and it is May 23rd. It is almost July. No, it is almost June. Don't do that, Nicholas. Don't skip forward the, the month of June. We need that. We need summer out here in Jersey because we don't get enough of it during the year. I don't get enough sunshine, man. It's driving me crazy out here with all the fucking screens. That's why I need these these glasses. I'd be staring at screens all day, man. So don't don't take T.Y. Hilton in the top 30 picks in best ball leagues, please. Who else? I do not like Brandon Cooks at all at pick 41. I probably should have just threw him under Jared Goff and have Jared Goff like preface Brandon Cooks. Um, I just think something to talk about when it comes to Cooks that's actually being underplayed here that no one's really talking about is like, yes, he's been excellent in fantasy football over the last three years. But when you actually break down year to year, right, his, his rookie year was with Drew Brees. Um, and they basically had no one else on their team that was a playmaker. So by default, he got like 130 targets. And you're not going to fail in Drew Brees' offense getting 130 targets, right? So I'm not saying that was fluky, but that it wasn't that difficult to produce then. Uh, year two was definitely a good year for Brandon Cooks. But last year, let's not forget, right, for the Patriots, he had another good year. They got him prior to Julian Edelman's injury, right? They got him prior to Julian Edelman's injury. So had Edelman not gotten injured, we're obviously not looking at Brandon Cooks the same way we are now as we would have been, right? Edelman would have taken a lot of targets. Obviously, they're different targets, but overall, it would have changed the workings of that offense. And they traded for him prior to the injury, so they knew that. Maybe they saw that and were like, he's not a really true number one. He's not the guy that we want to lead our team in targets. And then it just so happened to work out that way because of Julian Edelman's injury. I'm not saying that's the case, but I'm saying that's a different alternative to look at it because I don't think a lot of people talked about that when it came to it. So you had rookie year when Cooks was basically the only playmaker in that Saints offense. You had year three last year when the Patriots acquired him prior to the Julian Edelman injury. And I don't think they were looking to force feed him targets like they did last year. And had that not been the case, maybe he got 25 less targets or even more than that, Gronk missed time, Hogan missed a lot of time, not a lot of time, but all these players missed time, so that obviously inflated Cooks' numbers. You're not looking at Brandon Cooks as like, oh wow, he's been top 10 for three years in a row, right? You're looking at him a little differently. And lastly, uh, Damaris Thomas going at pick 46 with Emmanuel Sanders going at pick 82 is an absolute joke. So that's that, and guys, if you want more busts, my draft guide, which will be releasing early July, right? It's on a pre-order price right now. If you go to my website and purchase it, you're gonna get it for a discounted price. Once July 1st hits, the price is going up. And this will basically compiles all the information I'm putting out on my YouTube videos in my YouTube channel over the entire course of the summer into one place that you can get, including exclusive videos, exclusive blog posts only to the draft guide. So grab it now while it's at a discounted price. Do yourself a favor. You'll get my top busts, my top sleepers, all my, my overall 250 rankings, positional rankings by tiers, my Bible, which goes position by position, breaking down a big article for you guys. A bunch of really cool stuff in there. I promise you that. There's nothing like it on the market. I'm out here trying to change the game. So if you support me, if you're trying to win your league, make sure you go pre-order the draft guide, uh, which is up on bigdogsfantasy.com right now. And I will love you forever if you do that, of course. So that's going to wrap it up. Please hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe if you're new to the channel, as always, baby. We're trying to go global. We're trying to get bigger than all the mainstreams. It's the ultimate goal. I want to help y'all, so help me help y'all. And I'll see you on the next episode.